everyone, welcome back. I am Dr. Alexandra Mayer. If you are new to my channel, welcome. We're excited that you're here. If you've been watching our videos all along, we have a good video for you today. So today's video is on oils. Oils in skincare, which ones we think about, and then which oils we should definitely not be putting on our skin. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot, honestly. Like, oh, which oil should I put on my skin? Coconut oil or avocado oil? Um, the funny thing is, my answer would probably be neither. And, um, that really has to do with the function of the skin barrier and the function of what your skin loses as it ages, right? So we're gonna be going through those kind of things and we're gonna be talking about specific oils, maybe why they are in your products, right? As a little um, component of your products and how they may be offering benefit. Um, but before we do that, if you like the content that we're putting out, please go ahead and hit the like button. Um, drop us a comment and um, maybe share it with a friend. Um, every time we share our video with somebody, we just get to help more women like you, which is really our entire goal. So let's talk about the skin barrier, right? So when we think about the skin barrier, we're thinking about um, the two kind of functions. We're thinking about a protective function, like keeping things out, right? Um, with that goes with like an antimicrobial function. Um, we obviously don't want infection to enter the skin in any way, shape, or form. So our skin functions to protect us, right? It functions to keep things out, um, including bacteria. And then it has a function of keeping water in. So this is a fancy medical term for called transepithelial water loss. Basically, that's the amount of water that your skin loses, which is then evaporated off. Um, and we know that as skin ages, our skin becomes more permeable um, and actually trans epithelial water loss increases, meaning that you lose more water out of your skin barrier. Um, and so skin becomes drier and harder to hydrate, harder to hold on to that hydration. Um, when we think about the skin, we think about really the stratum corneum, which is this upper layer of your epidermis. So it's the very most upper layer of your skin, right? Um, and it really functions to provide a, a barrier. Um, and when we think about the stratum corneum, right, one of the things that's really important when you think about the stratum corneum is stratum corneum hydration. That's why people sometimes reach to oils, right? So oftentimes we think, okay, I put it on my skin and it leaves kind of a film on my skin. The word we use for that in dermatology or cosmetic medicine is occlusive, right? So it creates almost like a pseudo barrier, right? Sometimes we like that, sometimes we don't. It really depends on what we're looking for. But what are the other things that we're thinking about when we think about aging skin? So I did talk about this in a previous video, but there are lipids that are really important in your skin barrier that we lose as we age. Primarily ceramides, um, a variety of free fatty acids, and then cholesterol. And we know that ceramides and cholesterol decrease dramatically as we age. And so that's one of the reasons why our skin doesn't hold hydration as much and why our skin barrier function tends to be more impaired. When we think about the research on skin barrier, we're really usually looking at atopic dermatitis patients, right? Because we know that atopic dermatitis patients um, tend to have an impaired skin barrier and their, their skin function just isn't quite what we expect it to be. A lot of the research, right, on oils comes from that um, population because we know that they have so many issues with their skin barrier. Before we jump into um, oils specifically, which is what we were promised to talk about today, let's talk about things that irritate our skin barrier. So um, first of all, having environments that are too humid or too dry both impact our skin barrier. Things like irritants um, and allergens and pollutants also impact our skin barrier. Um, over exfoliating and over exfoliating can be both chemical and physical exfoliants. So when you age, right, using things like acids and retinols and things like that can be very, very, very important as a component of your skincare. However, overdoing them can make your hydration and your skin barrier function way worse. So sometimes what we need to do is be repairing that skin barrier. That's where things like ceramides and oils come in. Alkalizing detergents and soaps also uh, greatly impact skin barrier. So you've heard me talk in the past about how I'm not a fan of foaming cleansers, right? Um, they tend to have a higher pH and that can really lead to a disruption. And so that's something that we wanna think about. Um, and then psychological stress can actually also impact our skin barrier as does UV exposure. So those are kind of all things that we wanna think about if we're thinking about healing up our skin barrier. Um, let's always take a step back and look at what's causing the problem, right? And so those that's kind of a list of things that can cause that issue. So for a lot of patients, knowing that the skin is losing fatty acids um, as we age um, leads them to think that putting oils on their skin would be helpful. And really there's this push towards clean and organic skincare. And 
if you've been on my channel for a while, you may have heard me say it, but you're gonna hear me say it at some point. I am a big fan of medical grade clean skincare. And you will notice that I did not say organic. Um, that is because a lot of medical grade skincare is actually sourced from different countries. And so, although it's very clean, right? So it's not full of toxicants, it's not full of parabens and phthalates and things like that. Um, it is medical grade and so it actually works. And I think that's where we really start to notice the biggest difference in our skin is if we use things that work. Um, I think that when we do a lot of at home remedy-ish kind of situations, that's where we don't necessarily see as much benefit. And so I said at the beginning of the video, people will ask me, well, which, which oil should I put on my skin, coconut oil or avocado oil? And my answer is almost always neither. Um, if it's on the body, I might mention coconut oil. I might, if it's on the body, if it's on the face, I will definitely say neither because when it comes down to it, right, we want to, if we're aging, we want to replenish things like ceramides, we want to put, replenish things like cholesterol, um, and we want to make sure that we're repairing that skin barrier, and so science really comes into play with that. So without further ado, we're gonna kind of talk about oils that sit uh, high on the skin, right? And then oils that are able to penetrate a little bit deeper. So when we think about oils that sit high on the skin, um, olive oil sits really high on the skin. So it's not actually um, penetrated deep into that epidermis and it doesn't really go through deep into layers of the skin. Coconut oil actually also sits pretty high on the skin. It doesn't penetrate super deeply. And that's why when we think about where we want to get our hydration to, right? And what we're really looking for, Coconut oil may or may not be the answer for us, right? Um, other oils that sit high on the skin, although not as high as olive oil, so olive oil really doesn't penetrate, um, are things like um, grapeseed oil, avocado oil, almond oil, um, soybean oil. So our first oil we're gonna talk about is a major no-no for skin. It's a good oil for health. Health, awesome. Um, skin, no, and that is olive oil. So the research on olive oil uh, clearly shows that over time, long-term applications of olive oil will actually increase rates of dermatitis. And it has shown that it increases like the permeability of the skin, but not in a good way. Um, so more things are getting through because that skin barrier is greatly disrupted. So we know long-term application of olive oil disrupts the skin barrier, impacts skin penetration, not in a good way, um, and actually can cause ato atopic dermatitis. So if you are experiencing issues with your skin and you are using olive oil on your skin, that is probably the first thing that I would kick to the curb because uh, research on it is just not any good. The next one we're going to talk about is sunflower oil. So what's interesting with sunflower oil is sunflower oil has a higher level of linoleic acid. And I didn't mention this with olive oil, but I probably should have. Olive oils have high, um, high amounts of oleic acid. And it's interesting because oleic acid does have health benefits, but it is in very low concentrations in the skin. So when we're thinking about the actual free fatty acids that are in the skin, right? Um, if we're trying to mirror those a little bit more, going with something that has a higher level of linoleic acid is a better choice because we have higher levels of linoleic acid in our skin. Um, what's interesting with sunflower oil is that there is some research that shows some benefit, right? So there is some research that shows some benefit in atopic dermatitis patients, but then there is uh, other research that is very conflicting. So there was a research study that compared um, olive oil and, and sunflower seed oil in neonates, and they found that in the compare group, there was no difference. So what that means is that it's not having a, an increased benefit over olive oil, which we know is well studied in the skin to actually cause problems. Um, and in based on this research, the recommendation for future research was a long-term, kind of more longitudinal study looking at its potential for causing atopic dermatitis in patients. So sunflower oil, probably one I would stay away from. Right now the research is mixed and uh, could be leaning in the direction kind of the olive oil leans in where it's not gonna be quite as beneficial in the skin. What is interesting about sunflower oil um, or linoleic acid specifically, right, is that there was a study done in rats where they found that linoleic acid deficiency caused scaly puritic, which is basically just itchy, so scaly, itchy skin. Um, so although maybe putting sunflower oil on your skin might not be the best option, um, consuming foods that are higher in linoleic acid could be really helpful for the skin from the inside out. And sometimes that's what we need to do, right? Sometimes when we think about that skin barrier um, function, 
we not only want to think what, what are we putting on our skin topically, right? How do we hydrate the stratum corneum, but also what are we doing from the inside out? Um, and are we getting in enough fatty acids and some of those like healthy fatty acids that go into the skin? So increasing linoleic acid in your diet can be helpful. Although I wouldn't put sunflower oil on your skin topically. The next one is grapeseed oil. And we do honestly see grapeseed oil in a lot of products. And we see it because the research on grapeseed oil, particularly in wound healing, is very positive. So what we found in wound healing is that um, topical grapeseed oil helps with a uh, quicker contraction of the wound, um, increased levels of vasoendothelial growth factor, and an increased deposit of of connective tissue to be able to heal up those wounds. Um, so it actually is kind of positive. Um, with grapeseed oil, what we think about is that it's got high levels of resveratrol and high levels of vitamin E. And we do know vitamin E has some really great components in the skin, right? So grapeseed oil does give us both of those components. What's interesting with resveratrol is resveratrol is an ingredient that's used a lot in skincare and it has antimicrobial properties and it has antimicrobial properties against a few things, including Staph aureus. So I thought that was really, really interesting because when we think about things like MRSA and other skin infections, um, resveratrol is something that's added to products that could be really, really helpful. Um, the thing with grapeseed oil is that the, the research is really on wound healing, and so we're extrapolating that to things like anti-aging. We're not really, um, there aren't really like a ton of research studies that I've seen on anti-aging specifically with grapeseed oil extract, although it is a much better choice than olive oil or sunflower seed oil. Coconut oil is a big one. Um, everybody wants to put coconut oil on their skin for some reason, and honestly, the research on this is, is pretty good. There is some research study in pediatric patients that show um, amelioration in patients with mild to moderate um, atopic dermatitis, and they find that there's an improvement in skin barrier function and, in, and a decrease in transepithelial water loss, which is really kind of our main measurable factor when we think about skin barrier function. So coconut oil can be really, really helpful. Now I mentioned earlier that it doesn't penetrate deep into the dermis. The other thing that we want to think about with coconut oil is that although it can be helpful for, for creating kind of an inclusive barrier sitting on the skin and reducing transepithelial water loss, the question becomes, does it have enough to give us anti-aging properties? Um, and really, I don't think we know that yet, right? So it may be hydrating to the skin, but maybe if you have aged skin, you would do better with a um, medical grade skincare that has things like ceramides in it, right? Um, and has some other oils that are able to penetrate the skin or have a lot of research behind them. And so you get kind of like the science of skincare mixed with that hydration and skin barrier benefit. Um, although if you're gonna pick an oil, if you absolutely have to pick an oil to put on your skin, coconut oil could be okay. Um, I'm just really not a fan of kitchen oils from kind of the neck up, um, but on the skin, it's okay. So the next is soybean oil. So soybean oil has studies that demonstrate decreases in transepithelial water loss, meaning that when you put soybean oil on your skin, um, it holds its hydration better. And this could be due to the soy phytosterols, which have had really positive studies in the skin on them. Um, it's interesting, soybean oil isn't necessarily one that patients think to like grab from their cupboard, because I don't think a lot of people think of it like that, but it is in a lot of skincare, and it is in a lot of skincare because of this improvement in skin barrier function and this particular decrease in transepithelial water loss, so your skin is going to remain more hydrated long-term, because it's able to hold on to its own hydration, its own water. Avocado oil, okay. So um, the research on avocado oil is done in rats. Um, we don't have a ton of anti-aging or human studies. The research in rats did show an increase in reathelialization and higher levels of hydroxyproline, which is a necessary component in collagen. And so the studies are preliminary, but could be promising. Um, there aren't a lot of human studies. And so in terms of avocado oil, it may be helpful as an ingredient or component, but again, it really doesn't seem to, to penetrate super far into that epidermis. The next is jojoba oil. Um, so you have definitely heard of, of jojoba oil in skincare. Um, it is a common ingredient and it's a common ingredient for a good reason. Um, jojoba oil increases the penetration of other ingredients and so when we use jojoba oil as a base our the rest of our skincare ingredients tend to penetrate the skin a little bit better get a little bit deeper and have better effect. 
The other thing with jojoba oil is that it's high in wax esters, and so it makes it a really good choice for skin barrier repair. And studies have shown that it is actually anti-inflammatory, right? So when we think about um, repairing skin barrier and having that anti-inflammatory effect so that we're able to um, promote good collagen production and keep our collagen, uh, jojoba oil can be a really, really good choice. And I think this is added to a lot of, of um, cosmeceutical products because it does help to make your other ingredients potentially more effective. And finally, shea butter. So shea butter is another really common oil that's in, that's in skincare. And so shea butter, the research shows that it's anti-inflammatory in the skin, which is awesome. Um, but what is more interesting about shea butter is that when it went up against a ceramide precursor product, it actually performed as well as a ceramide precursor product, which to me means shea butter could be helping with those ceramides that we're actually losing as we age. And so actually kind of treating the skin as we age. So that was a lot of ingredients on different oils, right? And one of the questions that actually my assistant brought up to me was for oil cleansing. A lot of people cleanse as an, with oils as their initial kind of step in their skincare to break up makeup, um, and then we'll cleanse with another cleanser. I'm not opposed to oil cleansing. If that's something that you like to do, for me personally, I don't find that I need to do that because I have a good, I have a good cleanser and my cleanser does exactly what I expect it to do. It breaks apart my makeup, I have no issues with it. But if you are the kind of person who likes oil cleansing, that's a good option. Um, it's interesting, if you do a quick like Google search, right? Um, it will say which oils are good for oil cleansing. And the first one that is listed, the first in the first couple I would say that's listed is olive oil. Do not use olive oil as your oil cleanser. Um, I would say that is a bad idea, right? The research on that long-term shows that it's going to decrease your skin barrier function like we talked about and can actually cause atopic dermatitis. So you could definitely be making your skin worse. However, things like grapeseed oil could be a good option for oil cleansing. Um, coconut oil could be a good option for oil cleansing. Now, when you're oil cleansing, my recommendation would definitely be to cleanse with a good cleanser afterwards. Um, just leaving the oil on your skin, you're gonna do so much better. If you use some products that have ceramides, especially if your skin is aging and dry, um, products that have ceramides in them, products that maybe have a little bit of like jojoba oil or shea butter um, or soybean oil, right? those kind of mixtures of oils are gonna just be so much more beneficial. And if you're putting coconut oil on your skin to cleanse it, and then you're choosing to do your next stage of your regimen, so um, an acid or a retinol or whatever that looks like at the end of your day, right, vitamin C, um, none of those things are gonna be, be able to penetrate through that, that coconut oil because we know it really just sits on the skin. So um, that is my recommendation. I would go back and listen to kind of some of the oils and then choose which one might be best for um, oil cleansing if oil cleansing is something that you really wanna do. Um, and then there are actually products that are made specifically for oil cleansing. I wish I could say that I had a good recommendation on that, but I just don't, because I don't do it. I don't see it as necessary. Um, the cleanser that I love, I literally could not live without and um, it takes off my makeup, it acts as a toner, and I think that's why getting a good cleanser makes such a world of difference, and so that's kind of my recommendation. Um, but I wanna know, do you guys use oils on your skin? And I wanna know, do you use them on just your body, or would you actually use oils on your face? And did you find this video helpful? We will see you next week for next week's video.